Hello, everyone, and inside today's Locked On Canadians, Martin St. Louis is back behind the Habs bench, and the Habs are winning hockey games? You are Locked On Canadians, your daily podcast on the Montreal Canadiens, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 1039 of Locked on Canadian. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel, and remember to make every moment more, because right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets after any winning $5 bet. That's 200 bucks if your bet wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked on today to get started. I am one of your hosts. I am Scott Matlin. I'm joined as always by the active stick, Laura Seba, on this your Everyday Montreal Canadiens podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where you get your team every single day of the week, wherever you get your daily podcast on Google, Apple, Spotify, or if you're watching uh, on YouTube.com as well there. Uh, we couldn't get a show out last night. Late West Coast games mess with both of our schedules a whole lot. We apologize. We're going to get into that today. The good news is no more 9 p.m. games. We are done. No more West Coast. The latest game start this season is 7.30 p.m., which is annoying, but fine. No more West Coast games. Laura, uh, it wasn't a masterpiece, but it is a Habs win in an important game that we will get into. So how are you feeling after a 2-1 win over the nuclear hot Colorado Avalanche? That game was fun. It was really unexpected. It was great. It felt really good. But right now I'm distracted by how messy both our hair is on this uh, this YouTube. Um, I don't want to talk about it. Like, (laughs) I admit, if my fiance is watching this, I'm already going back to my barber on Friday. I haven't had a haircut since October. So, like, it's it's been a while at this point. Um, whereas I, I have no excuse other than my hair is just always like this. Uh, I'm so sorry about that listeners. All right. Um, that, that was unexpected. And both Scott and I had a little bit of trouble staying up, even though the game itself was great. Like I really enjoyed it. And I don't want to look at the stats. I've avoided looking at the underlying stats because no matter what you say, the Montreal Canadians beat the Colorado avalanche in Marty's return. It was like, like that just that moment for him just made me feel so warm and fuzzy inside. And I think that's the biggest thing here. Cause I look at, you know, the Canadians crack in game and it was maybe a little more ugly. This one, you know, again, Colorado is a better team, was a better team than the Montreal Canadians. I don't think that's really up for debate. Nathan McKinnon scored 43 seconds into this game. And I texted Laura that I would be in bed by the end of the first period. And then Nick Suzuki scored five minutes later five minutes later, my God, nine seconds later. And I'm looking at the numbers here. Uh, Corsi four, five on five, Colorado had a big edge, but shots for five on five, fairly even scoring chances, 33, 22 for Chicago, about even in the high danger chances, expected goals, 2.73 to 1.82. Uh, Samuel Montembeau was phenomenal in this game. I don't think anyone would doubt that his triple save on miles Wood. Uh, he was so, so good in this. I'm I'm just kind of going back and looking through some of the numbers here. Fourth line, not good. Uh, but David Savard, of all people, leads the team in Corsi 4 percentage at 70.37%. Brendan Gallagher leads the team in expected goals. Then David Savard and Yoel Armia. And then Josh Anderson. Those were your four positive expected goal members in this game. Thought Anderson played decently. I thought Yol Armia played great and he got rewarded with a goal he deserved. He gets the game winning goal because of a heads up play where he sees that the the puck has not been frozen. It is loose. He picks it up, goes around the net, tucks it in. It's smart hockey. Uh I'm glad Yol Armia is getting rewarded and it's a 2-1 game and the thing is it wasn't chippy, it wasn't feisty. I don't have a lot of complaints about anything in this. And people will talk that, ah, it's two points they probably didn't need and this and that. Some things go beyond just being about points and goals and assists. This was Martin St. Louis 
uh, first game back behind the bench after being away for a family issue. And as we learned, a, it was not a small thing. This was not, you know, someone's, you know, got flu or COVID or whatever. His son suffered an injury at an under 16 hockey tournament, suffered complications and had to be hospitalized. He was a way to be with his family. And we know that he was probably taken away from that when he went to coach the Montreal Canadiens. He was, I believe, coaching, you know, one of those, I think it was an under 15 team at the time when they called him in. And the story that came out, and I believe it was 98-5 in uh, Quebec, uh, Martin McGuire pointed this out that when the team got to the hotel in Denver, sitting in the lobby and waiting there for them was Martin St. Louis. It was a very emotional moment. Lots of hugs and handshakes and support. If there's a win that you can feel good about this season, it is very much this one. Little things like that show that this is a team that is pulling on the rope together, is driving in the same direction. It's not always pretty, but I will take a team that will fight tooth and nail for their coach without that coach being a disciplinarian every single day of the week. Laura's on mute. <laughs> uh, I was about to say, that's the thing. Like when we, when we first learned that Martin St. Louis was going to be the coach, we did not know what to expect because of his inexperience. But one thing that we were all sure of was that um, he was going to be able to connect with this team on a level where, it, it would be unparalleled. And I think one of the things is as, as, as a coach, a lot of the time you do want to motivate your team. You want to get them, you know, fired up, but you can't discount the trust that they have in him and the calming side of that. Like, I think for me, the biggest thing was that like motivation doesn't always have to be uh, just, um, what was it? Was it, was it piss and vinegar that, uh, Jake Allen would, would say, <laughs> um, it, it's not that it's it's sometimes it's just a matter of like knowing what to do and he you can see in the development of the team like you can see in all those players that have been able to find a new level to their game or break out entirely by sort of stepping back and becoming calmer becoming more confident becoming more reassured but at the same time like that emotional um boost of having him there really I think it, it went both ways right and that that to me, like everything about that was like, I don't want to look at the underlying stats because I just want to cry with joy. And the thing about this game too, is that there were important parts in this game that go beyond, you know, Martin St. Louis return. And don't get me wrong. That is at the top of them in this game. Slav Nick Suzuki, I was going to get to that. Nick <laughs> sorry, Suzuki, sorry. new career high in points. He's one goal away from 30 on the season by far the most consistent Montreal Canadian this year. He is pulling an absolutely massive weight this season, and he is responding with the best season of his professional career. Talking about worlds, the Olympic games, four nations, all those things. Nick Suzuki should be in your conversation for those right now. And then the biggest thing is on Nick Suzuki's goal, right after Nathan McKinnon scored, Uri Slavkovsky gets the primary assist when he deflected a David Savard pass, clearing attempt, whatever you want to call it to allow Suzuki into the offensive zone. That is an eight-game point streak, beating his previous point streak, best as a teenager in Montreal Canadiens history, and sets a new franchise record for points as a teenager in a single season for the Montreal Canadiens. It's 40 points, and people go, oh, it's not a lot. Look at what Matthews or Marner or McDavid did. The difference is, is that those teams didn't have guys in the 70s and 80s. Younger guys did not make the Canadians in an era where scoring was this high. What Matthews and Marner and all these guys are doing is incredible. Do not get me wrong. To do it in the Montreal Canadiens organization that have been around so long, where teenagers often are not in those lineups. There's very few. And for him to do that in this season where the team is not performing great, there are injuries. He's still trying to find his own way. He has rewarded the faith the coaching staff put in him by saying, we are putting you on the top line. And Uri Slavkovsky has responded by being fantastic. I believe it's 23 points in his last 32 games. I might have those numbers reversed. I'm not 100% sure, but he has been outstanding. There's a very real 
shot that he could hit 50 points on the season. I'd like to see if he can hit the 20 goal plateau. We will see there if he keeps this up. We know that their schedule is not getting a lot easier, but that hasn't phased him at all. If you're going to win a game, hell, make it important. Montembeau win, Suzuki career high in points, Slavkovsky record in point streak, Yol Armia goal win for your coach. If you're going to win a game, you win it like that. I have so many feelings. We got to change the topic right now. I was going to say we will because now we have to talk <laughs> about the Philadelphia Flyers, which boo, hiss, boo. Anyways, we're going to get into that uh, coming up in our next segment. But first, as I said, off the top of the show, say goodbye to Busted Brackets, folks, because FanDuel lets you bet on every single game of the March Madness Tournament. Whether you're betting on a big upset, the one seed, it is time to go dancing with America's number one sports book. And right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets if your $5 bet wins. That's 200 bucks to use on the point spread money lines. You can even just pick who's going to win it all and cash out in a big way. All you got to do, just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on. That is L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N and bet on college hoops until they cut the nets down. They don't call it March Madness for nothing. Go in there, $5 bet. All you got to do is win, $200 cash out and more. And please remember to just bet responsibly. We are back here at Locked On Canadians. We are, uh, of course, your daily Montreal Canadiens podcast. And we're we're making up for lost time here a little bit. I was looking at the Habs schedule. They're coming back from the West Coast. And my brain is not readjusted to that quite yet. I've only been able to catch bits and pieces of this entire road trip due to prior commitments and a lot of other things. I am very grateful they are back on this half of the country where hockey is played at a normal time and not uh, but a, a clock million at night, o'clock. A million o'clock. And up next is the Philadelphia Flyers. Um, the Flyer, yes. I was going to say I would almost rather they stay on the West Coast than play the Philadelphia Flyers right now. I, I, out of every team in the NHL, the one I do not understand the most, well, the Washington Capitals, how they're in a playoff spot, I will never understand. I do not understand the Philadelphia Flyers who are teetering on that edge of we're so back, it's so over. And then I look and they are, well, they are one point out of the wild card. They are in third place in the Metro. And I they thought are, they would be like the bottom three this year. Well, here's the thing. They might end up there anyways. The Devils have <laughs> 79 points. The Capitals have 81. Oh, I'm sorry. The Devils have 76 points. I was reading the wrong one there. The Islanders have 75. The Flyers have 82. The team in front of them ha- is 15 more points ahead of them. That is Carolina and New York has 100 points. Wow. The Phil- I do not understand the Philadelphia Flyers at all. We spent a lot of time talking about how bad the Western Conference is. Like, I feel like we've forgotten something. <laughs> I mean, we should know how bad the Eastern Conference is. I mean, for God's we're sake, in we it. play. Yeah, we, we're in it. I look at this team, and Joel Faraby, Travis Konechny, Owen Tippett are having very good seasons. It's just they are a team that I do not understand. Yet. Yes. it's They scratched Sean Couturier for a couple of games, and then Torts just refused to talk about it. And it's just kind of like, what? what do you – why are you scratching – your team captain. I don't. And then I go back. And he's here like a looking. linchpin of this team, right? Like that's the thing. Like Sean Couturier in the absence or, or after uh, Claude Giroux left, like this became Sean Couturier's team. He's one of the, where well was, and I admittedly have not looked at like the underlying numbers and everything. That's not, to be quite honest, is not my job. You can have our folk, uh, Russ and Rachel over at Lockdown Flyers can give you a much better description of what is going on there. But I look at this team, and this is just their month of March. Lost 5-2 to the Capitals. 1-4-2 against the Senators. Lost 2-1 in a shootout to the Blues. 1-2-1 over the Panthers. Got shut out 7-0 by the Lightning. Win <laughs> 3-2 over the Sharks, barely. Lose 6-2 to Toronto. Lose 6-5 to Boston. Win 4-3 over Toronto. Lose 3-2 to Carolina. Win 3-2 over Boston. Lose 4-1 to the Panthers. Lose 6-5 in overtime to the Rangers on Tuesday. Then they have the Habs, and they play the Blackhawks on Saturday. I don't understand what the Flyers are. I I truly am just bewildered by this team 
that they go on these hot streaks. Like they won one, two, three, four, lost to Toronto in overtime, got blown out in the stadium series by the Devils, beat the Blackhawks, lose to the Rangers, lost seven, six to the Penguins, then beat the Lightning six, two. They could come out and beat the brakes off the Montreal Canadiens tomorrow night. Or, or the day that... yeah, or lose six, one. And, and neither one would be a surprise. And the most confusing part of everything here, they have used all of their deadline recalls already. They cannot call anybody else up unless it is an emergency situation from the AHL. They do not have anything. I am looking at their goaltending. Their starting goaltender, who has played 43 games this year, 21, 14, and 7 on the year in the 41 games he's finished, 895 save percentage. Then they have Felix Sandstrom, who is backing up Samuel Urson. 823 save percentage, 3.87 goals against, 1-2 and two on the season. This is not a team that is getting the goaltending they need to succeed right now. It is just bewildering that this team didn't trade for a goalie, did not acquire one on waivers, did not do anything they needed to and are still in a current playoff spot right now. And I'm just taking a look at all the goaltenders this year. Obviously, Cal Peterson was waived. He's down in the AHL. And we know that their regular starter this year, Carter Hart, is on, I don't know if they're calling it leave or suspension, pending the Hockey Canada investigation. And it shows in this team. Because every single one of their goalies outside of Carter Hart is below a 900 save percentage. That's not good enough for a team that wants to make the playoffs here. And they have teams that are breathing down their neck. And even now, if they do make the playoffs, like shoddy goaltending isn't going to get them far. I, yeah, I, yeah, it, it, it's, I just, I'm looking at their division. They are up by one point on the Capitals and five by the Devils, who now with Jake Allen have decided that they can stop the puck, which is very, very funny to me. They're within, they can potentially choke this away almost all the way down. Not the Penguins. The Penguins are very close to being eliminated from the playoffs, which is very, very funny to me, especially. Uh, I, I don't know what to make of this game. The Flyers, I know, can score goals in bunches, but when the wheels fall off, you, Laura, you've been on hockey Twitter long enough, as have I, that you remember here come the Oilers. Yes. That when the wheels fall off, they fall off. It is catastrophic. And the Flyers are just peak whatever that is. And yet they're still in a playoff spot. We haven't even talked at like anything about the Habs or like what we're expecting in this game. And <laughs> it's just like I'm anticipating Caden Primo gets the start in this game. He always seems to get the Philadelphia and the New Jersey games being that from he's there. from that area and the Flyers ties and everything. And to be honest, he hasn't played badly. He's earned he's earned the spots or he's earned those uh, starts so far. I just want to get to the goaltending stats real quick. Caden Primo on the season is a 9-10 save percentage, 7-7-2, seven, seven 2.85 goals against. Caden Primo would right now be far and away the best goaltender on the Flyers, <laughs> and it's not even remotely close. Like, Which, if you are reading this, Dan, or if you are listening to this, Danny Briere, let's talk. Caden Primo for mm, prospect that I haven't looked up yet. And we'll go with that from there. Uh, and then I assume Samuel Montemo will get the start against Carolina this weekend. But I don't know. This is a toss up game because I feel like the Canadians have had this run where play well against the Oilers, maybe not so much against the Canucks, blew out the crack in one of their boogeyman teams, beat the Avalanche, played decently well on the West Coast for the first time in forever. Who knows? This might be that the game where they come out and it's like, yeah, we had a hard fought four, two victory, or right. they could just come out and their pants fall down and they lose six, nothing. There's <laughs> that. That's just how the season goes. I realize I have talked a lot, Laura. So I didn't know if you had other, uh, if you wanted to inject some of your own thoughts into this game here. Uh, not really much like you. I tried to kind of make sense of them uh, before, you know, when we were trying to, trying to preview this game. Oh, sorry, before recording, and I don't get them, and I used to pay a lot more close attention to the Flyers, like I used to watch a lot of their games, I no longer do that, so it, it just seems like, you know how every once in a while, like, 
retorts, maxes out the ability of his team, and then before he loses the room and and they lose the plot, like it feels like we're still in that era of torts. And, that, and that's, I think that's key. I think we're getting to that. If they're not winning games, everyone kind of realizes that torts might be maybe not the best coach in the world. Um, again, Raw, uh, Russ and Rachel over at Lockdown Flyers have covered so much that they are ingrained with that, that we highly recommend you go check them out. They are wonderful people. They know so, so much uh, about that. Them. If you're in, if yes, they are fantastic that we would have done a crossover head. We had the time to plan that out with them, but go check them out. They will have everything you need before and after the game. Thoughtful, considerate, very, very good covered content there. Uh, if we, Oh, yes, we also have the mailbag coming up. I forgot about <laughs> that before we transition to our last segment uh, on this. Tomorrow night after the Habs and Flyers do whatever the Habs and Flyers are going to do, we have the Friday mailbag. Just tweet us at LO underscore Canadians, lockdown Canadians at gmail.com or in the YouTube comments, MBQ in your title for your comment and let us know. We're going to dive into the final segment. We're going to talk what's going on in the AHL and more coming up next. But first, passion, drive, and patience is what brings home the winning trophy and is also what keeps your ride or die alive. And with eBay Motors, they have everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance from superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, style, eBay Motors has got you covered. And with over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you are looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride or your money back because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, you're not burning cash, and with the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. So keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Some exclusions may apply. eBay guaranteed fit available only to United States customers. We are back here at Locked on Canadians, and we were thinking about a third segment here, and there was a lot of prospect stuff going on. Part of the reason that this is coming out later tonight is, well, the Rocket we're playing. And unfortunately, I don't really have a exciting uh, uh, Rocket recap to have for you. They lost 3-1 to the Utica Comets. Uh, Jacob Perot gets his first as a Rocket player. Jakob Dobish was incredible and everyone else was not. Uh, they uh, break their three game winning streak. They had three really good games over the season or over the weekend, the weekend. that coinc over the weekend that coincided with uh, David, David Reinbacher's debut. Yes. And Laura and Sebastian did a really, really good job kind of covering everything in there. I know I talked a little bit about it on the Monday episode. People want to know, Hey, how are the prospects doing? What's going on there? Well, Logan Mayu is the most goals by a defenseman in Laval Rocket history, and he's likely going to continue to add to that. Jakob Dobish has the most wins for a goalie in Laval Rocket history. He has already added to that and then some. And then it kind of gets a little murky. Players like Riley Kidney maybe aren't where they need to be. Sean Farrell has the creativity, and you can see it but sometimes his line mates are just maybe not where you want them to be at that current point. And that makes it kind of hard to look at and be like, Hey, you know, let's, let's go. This is exactly what we want. Uh, they have two more games against Belleville this upcoming weekend, which are crucial. Belleville is the team that is just behind them in the standings that is chasing them uh, for that final playoff spot. Uh, Laura, I know that, you don't get a chance to tune in as often as I do because of that. Did you have thoughts or questions that you had about the Rocket right now? I absolutely do have questions because you did bring him up. Um, Sean Farrell, I have been thinking about him uh, a lot lately. And my question to you was, how has his development curve been over the course of this year with, as compared with respect to your expectations as to how he was to progress? Like, I think... At the moment that he signed, um, you know, he signed and he showed up, I don't think anybody had any expectation that he was going to be a full-time NHLer this year in any way. Um, I don't even necessarily know that people were waiting for a cup of coffee this year, 
but I know he has been one of the instrumental forwards um, on the rocket. But I wanted to know, like, we don't we don't have that same hype around him that I normally would have expected. So how has the, his development been relative to expectations? And what is your expectation for next season for him? Well, I'm looking at it right now. He has 25 points in 39 games, which isn't a terrible production clip. You know, 0.64 points per game. That's not terrible by any means for a guy who isn't, and I say this respectfully, not a superstar forward, but a very good complimentary piece there. And he's doing it now without Joshua Wah, who he had a lot of synergy with, without Xavier Simono, who was out injured for the rest of the season, which wounds me deeply in a lot of ways. And on a team that is sometimes struggling to generate offense that isn't coming from the defense. And I look at tonight that you have someone like Emil Heineman who has 22 points in 40 games. He's Heineman himself is not probably where they were hoping he would be at this year. They were hoping maybe Durando and uh, Perot come in, maybe Riley Kidney steps up. Kidney has 19 points in 57 games. It's it's a long term thing with this team is that they are not playing poorly but they are maybe not as good as we've seen them at their peak. We've seen Sean Farrell dominate the NCAA. We know that. We saw Riley Kidney light up the QMJHL. We saw Joshua Watt do that. Watt is potentially just a better player overall than that. And they're guys that next year are going to be expected to fill a bigger role. Farrell especially. And then Kidney, it's going to be, hey, let's, you know, what can we do here to kind of get him going a little bit? The Rocket as a whole are a team that don't just dominate with one star player. It is, you know, kind of spread out. You have a 54-point leader on the team, Brandon Jignac, then 46, 42, 37, 37 out for the year, 32 called up to the NHL, 27 points, 25 points, 24 points, 22, 22. It is scoring by committee. You're not going to have guys that are truly punching above their weight. Yes, Mayu is part of that because he has an absolutely game-breaking shot from the point there, he does a lot with that and utilizes it. This is a team that one, if they can figure out the power play more regularly, especially the second unit, they're going to get more goals next year. And just a year of maturity and learning the flows and the ins and outs of the game are going to be massive for this team. And I think next year is going to be the year that we see Sean Farrell take that next step forward. I think he's going to be counted on in a big way for this rocket team and I think he's smart enough and creative enough that he's really going to make a lot happen. Uh, and for those asking, Jakob Dobish will definitely be your goaltender next year as well. I would expect absolutely nothing else. I just because the Canadians have two goaltenders right now, and I don't think Jacob Fowler is coming over right now. Uh, and he's good where he is. He's he's doing amazing things. And that's the next part is I wanted to get into is that Frozen Four starts tomorrow, and there are one two. Three, four, four, four Habs prospects playing tomorrow at 8.30 p.m. Eastern time. Minnesota, five. I miscounted. Uh, I forgot Luke Middlestat. My bad. I always forget one of the Lukes when I'm counting this. Minnesota takes on Omaha. You have Luke Middlestat and you have Rhett Pitlick uh, playing for Minnesota at 8.30. 5 p.m. Eastern time, Boston University. You have Lane Hudson and you have Luke Tuck playing RIT. Unfortunately, I am cheering against Boston because I want Lane Hudson in a Canadian's jersey as soon as possible. And I am from Rochester. Uh, go Tigers, you bunch of engineering dorks. Uh, Maine Cornell at 5.30 p.m. And at 2 p.m. Eastern time, you have Denver versus Massachusetts. Habs prospect Sam Harris uh, from the previous draft is playing for Denver this year as a freshman. Uh, and then the next day, Jacob Fowler plays at 2 p.m. for Boston College and... That is the last of the Habs prospects in there. ESPN, ESPN Plus in the United States. In Canada, I would assume TSN will potentially carry some of these games. I am not 100% sure on that, and I don't want to lie to people. But I also someone... don't want to tell people where I was watching it before. So. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It, uh, it's definitely a very legitimate. Uh, uh, it's the best site you've ever heard of. Never heard of, I should uh. say. Yes. Anyways, nobody's ever heard of it. It does not exist. Yeah, I know. Anyway, switching off uh, <laughs> of that hockey for now. Um, 
that's going to wrap up this show here a little bit. We just want to talk to prospects, kind of give people a preview for, hey, what are you doing on Thursday? Because it's almost Good Friday and no one is working for the back half of this week. Uh, unless you're me trying to sell beer before Dingus Day and a solar eclipse, which is super cool, super fun. Uh, remember, mailbag questions at LO underscore Canadians, lockdown Canadians at gmail.com, MBQ in the YouTube comments. We will be back after the Habs and Flyers game tomorrow night. We'll recap that mailbag questions. Take a look at the Frozen Four tournament and everything that's going on with that. Follow Laura at the Active Stick. Follow myself at Scott Matla. Uh, don't be a jerk on Twitter. Uh, and that'll wrap the show. And we will see you all later.